Let me give you a couple of quotes. First of all, from uh, Laurie Garrett. Uh, she was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and she said, uh, the, the tranquil days since the discovery of antibiotics are gone. The message is clear. We must drop our complacency and learn from the past epidemics or face the consequences. Uh, so that was a pretty... I mean, then we have the well-known Burnett and Wild epidemiologists uh, 1972 saying the most likely forecast about the future of infectious disease is that it will be very dull. <laughs> <laughs> Who is right? <laughs> Yeah, off you go. Well. <laughs> I think, uh, well, there's, a, there's probably a bit of truth on both sides. Interestingly, since the last quote in 1972, we've seen uh, around 30 totally new unknown diseases. Gosh, you need to have one. <laughs> including such quite interesting ones as SARS, HIV, mypovirus, which certainly have got livened up the, the headlines, okay. uh, livened up the lives of people in Hong Kong who, who during the SARS epidemic, one in three thought they were very likely to get us, okay, and 75% said they would die. Mm -hmm. well, what about, you say both are true, okay, so that one is, well, why is the other one true? The other one, is, the, the other one is true that infectious disease, given even with all these plagues and rumours of plagues, I mean, we're still in a, in a world which has 6 billion people, we're still only talking about 50 million deaths a year. So, they say, <laughs> I mean, if you happen to be one of those 50 million, of course it's pretty rough. Well, I think that's the important point. <laughs> Uh, the important point of, of that in demographic terms, uh, uh, that, that, that we have to put it in that context. Jeff, have you got any comment on those two? Yeah, I think both statements are true. Um, certainly HIV is the big lesson that, that an emerging disease can really become a world problem and, and shape how societies are, are living today, so we can't ignore them. Um, definitely infectious disease is not a problem that's solved. I think the AIDS epidemic kind of put that theory to rest, that you know, we were facing things like cancer is the big problem. No, it's an infectious disease is still a big problem. I think there is an element of hype, especially with bird flu, um, where there's uh, people trying to mobilize resources and use some of these things to mobilize resources. Uh, it becomes difficult to predict, you know, just how big a threat is bird flu. We know it is possible for it to evolve into a human pandemic. It could be a terribly infectious virus for people. Um, on the other hand, it may evolve into something more like SARS, which is only mildly transmitted in people and then can be contained easily. Okay, we'll come back to bird flu. What, what, what do we mean by a plague? What, is a, what, what, what do we mean by a plague? This word is used, and use, it's a sort of a scary word, isn't it? Well, what, what do we mean by it? Well, originally a plague was, was something sent, a pestilence, something sent from the gods which killed lots of people. <laughs> so, I think in terms... Now, we, now in terms of, people talk more about emerging infectious diseases and pandemics and epidemics. So an, epide an endemic is a disease which is, is there at a, at a certain level. An epidemic is when it flares up and goes into new places. Okay, why do pandemics happen? And a pandemic... I keep interrupting you, but I'm going to keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you've got all these prepared speeches in the back of your head. <laughs> Well then, to, 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 to sort of wriggle around the question again, <laughs> it all depends. Because if there are different pandemics, they happen for different reasons. Um, the HIV pandemic transmission was linked to things like global, trans global movements, uh, changes in behaviour, human behaviour. Basically, I think if we look at all the big pandemics and plagues, that there is one key factor, and that's humans. Humans they, living in groups. Okay, are they more frequent now than they were? Um, Probably, they probably they have a bigger impact. They affect more people, but that's because there's more people around to be affected, but um, less frequent. Jeff, what do you do? You, you look puzzled. You don't look as if you're agreeing with that. No, I think actually you make a point in your question, and I think the way globalization, the way the world's changed, transport is much more rapid. Things are moving around the world more quickly. People are moving around more quickly. So there is, a, I think, an increased threat that these things can spread very, very fast across the globe. But in terms of pandemics, I mean, 7,000 years ago, probably you know, the first uh, epidemic of measles uh, uh, emerged from, uh, from, from Rinderpest, possibly. Yeah. Uh, and that must have caused quite a little uh, uh, flurry in the news media of the 
day. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's, not, it's not new, it's the, it's the context of our communication, is it? In part, it's also communication, and I get to the, the element of hype. I think in the developed world there is this understanding that people shouldn't have to die from infectious disease anymore. So when they hear that an infectious disease in the developing world might come into Europe or the United States, you know, it's especially concerning. Um, and TV and all these different media have a, have a, a part in that, creating a hysteria. If um, bird flu got to the States now and a chicken died, I think you'd see everyone stay home from work for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a real impact. Well, it, not only uh, the, the hype, uh, Weiss and McMichael put, uh, talk about these four, uh, four phases, four historical transitions in infectious disease. Uh, the, the one of the measles emerging uh, from 10,000 years ago on, uh, the extensions that happened in classical times when people started uh, having battles and trading, uh, the, the explorations and colonization extensions, and now we're in the fourth historical transition, which is globalization. It, is, it, are you, do you agree with that? Is that a sort of reasonable uh, description? I think, yes, I think that's, I mean, the plagues probably started with the, the agricultural revolution, which was 10,000 years ago when people first started to live with animals. The first agricultural revolution. Because that was, <laughs> <laughs> well, the big Neolithic revolu agricultural revolution. Okay. I'm, I'm skipping, I'm, I'm sort of playing down the 60s one, or even the livestock <laughs> 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 which was now got bigger in some perspectives. But, I mean, that brought humans and animals together. And of the emerging infectious diseases now, 75% are still zoonotic. So the biggest route to plagues into people is from animals. What role has better diagnostics uh, played? We, we now can do all sorts of things that we could never do, even a few years ago. Jeff? Um, hmm. I'm maybe not the right person to ask that, because I'm <laughs> more on the active surveillance side. It's more about finding the cases uh, in these recent events. Um, oh, we yeah. fast diagnostics, but that's, I don't think the limiting factor in many instances today, uh, especially in the developed world, we have very good diagnostics. It's, it's finding the cases, getting the samples in to be tested. That's the issue. Okay, but has, has it changed our perception? We, 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 with all these new tools, we're finding things that, uh, that may or may not be a problem. Well, I think we're finding things that we're able to distinguish between different forms of disease to see that there's uh, a greater diversity in agents causing diseases. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, let's look, uh, looking at our target regions of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, uh, what are the greatest risks for, for these regions in terms of uh, emerging infectious diseases? Well, Both for humans and livestock. Well, I mean, there is going to be a pandemic flu at some stage. That is inevitable, almost inevitable. Do you think so? Unless that we have another pandemic in the meantime which d decreases the population to such a level. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I remember at uh, the ISLU which you attended, Roger Morris uh, said that on a scale of 0 to 10, uh, his estimation of the possibility of a pandemic had gone up from 3 to 4. <laughs> well, so I you're mean, saying it's higher than that? Yeah, because, I mean, if you've you got different information. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a different perspective on the information, okay. which is the historical, which is um, the past is the best guide to the future. It's, it's not a perfect guide, but it's the only one we have. And since the seventh, since the 18th century, in the past 300 years, I mean, there has been an average of one pandemic every 30 years. So these pandemics come pretty regularly. And we don't really see why they should stop now, especially as a lot of the risk factors are actually getting worse, you know, in terms of poultry populations, vulnerable people, all the rest of it. And I, I think, as they say, any given year, there's about, just on historical evidence, there's about a 3% chance that this year will be the pandemic year. So it's going to come, but maybe not now. Well, what are the major dangers? I mean, clearly the ecosystem changes, and as you pointed out, human population growth and, uh, and ecosystem uh, interactions and urbanization, etc. Well, how do they rate versus the uh, specific species dangers? So, so uh, acquiring uh, new infections from bats, for example. Bats are, bats are not nice things. <laughs> Well, maybe if you're a bat. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the viruses, for example, I mean, we talked about diagnostics, but um, the problem is therapeutics. We've got great diagnostics. We, we can tell everybody they're sick and they're going to die. <laughs> for most of these viruses, we actually don't have any treatments, and that is the big stumbling block. 
or the treatments are not, you know, the treatment may be like Tamiflu, that may help the virus, but what about the cytokine storm, so that they're not effective? But you didn't quite, you're going back Sorry, to I'll get the question. You didn't answer my question about bats. Bats. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Jeff bats. I mean, we've got uh, SARS, Nipah virus, Hendra virus. I mean, bats are the nasty ones there. And here we've got uh, um, the Macola and uh, Dubenhager that are, that are lurking, about to emerge. Is that true? I mean, do you think bats are a real danger? I don't think they're a danger in comparison to any other species. It happens that we see a number of viruses come out of them recently. Um, I mean, AIDS was supposed to come from monkeys, wasn't it? Yeah. So that seems to be a much bigger issue. Uh, so I don't think we... Bats are nice. What about the you're both epidemiologists, so we haven't got the balance here, because all virologists uh, feel that new diseases are going to emerge uh, as a result of mutations and, uh, and genetic issues, whereas epidemiologists uh, say that they're going to be from ho different host agent environment interactions. Who's right? <laughs> I think it's the same issue. I mean, what causes evolution? Yeah, and that's, um, you know, the new viruses are, are selected for by these different host agent environment interactions. Um, I think one of the trends we're seeing that are making things more dangerous, besides the mobility that you mentioned, is the density. You know, just the population density is going up. And in some parts of the world, the degree of human contact with uh, animals and feral animals is, is increasing. That's okay. Kind of so, can these diseases be predicted? Can we predict these new, these, these emerging diseases? We can predict that there will be new emerging diseases. <laughs> <laughs> we can't predict which ones. I mean, and to go back to the bats. Yeah, we have, I got a quote from, uh, I can't remember who it was, and here I've written down, but we must expect the unexpected. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because in terms of, I mean, pathogens and wildlife, and a lot of these, these latest have come from, be it HIV or SARS or Nipah, they've come from wildlife. And if I can quote another random statistic, they reckon we, of all the pathogens in wildlife, we, are, we know about, we have characterized about 1%. So 99% are uncharacterized. And there's nobody who is doing this in a systematic way. So out of that 99%, we can be pretty okay. sure of I mean, but come on. I said, can they be predicted? <laughs> Not can we go and find the other 99%. Uh, we, you know, we don't know whether they're ever going to emerge. Can you predict these, uh, these the emergence? And, and what sort of tools have we got at our disposal? Jeff, go on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we can predict emergence, but we can do a better job of early detection and okay. early response. Um, and I think that's the key lesson that we need to do. Um, certainly we can postulate and theorize, and I think somebody said dream and technicolor about new possible agents coming up, but uh, the key is that's predictable is um, to enhance surveillance systems around the world, to enhance sensitivity that these things are going to happen and that we need to deal with them in a logical and sustained fashion, not as one-off, let's rush and do the emergency type thing. Okay, we can come back to that, but I just want to stick on the prediction of the medical. The, the, the Medical Research Council in the UK has just set up this Center for Outbreak Analysis uh, with Neil Ferguson as the, as the head of that. What are they going to do? <laughs> what do you think they're going to do? <laughs> Well, they they do. Should do. <laughs> well, I would hope that they would be early responders to try and actually work out what's going on on the ground at some they, of these events. They're going to model them. They're going to model you know, what will happen when they come in, and uh, to, presumably taking all the you know, foot and mouth and avian flu. Isn't that what they're going to do? Well, modeling is also an important tool. If you look at like AI, modeling informs us that if a truly pandemic human virus comes out, we've got about two weeks to contain it before it globalizes. And that means we're not going to contain it. <laughs> <laughs> so modeling can play a very important role. Yes. Do we have the right models? I, I saw, for example, there's one from the, uh, the Max Planck Institute along with the University of Santa Barbara that just, been, just published this one on banknote tracking uh, that they thought that it would be a very useful way uh, of understanding in the United States. Uh, most banknotes travel a very short distance, but a few let long distances, uh, uh, and they've been sort of trying to use this to calculate probability. Is that, in, is that a reasonable technique, or what others are there? Well, I think there's a quite a variety of models around. Uh, it always becomes a debate which one is the right model. And I think uh, the best way you can do that is to, is to utilize them and compare them to the, to the field data that's available. The problem is that many of these events, the field data that we actually have is very sketchy when we get down to it. The actual information, the hard information about what bird flu has done or how these outbreaks have evolved is often anecdotal. 
So then how do you validate and model with that information? That's the challenge. Okay, let's move on to the impact of these emerging uh, human and animal plagues on our target populations, uh, the poor. What, what has been, uh, you have described on avian flu, keeping away from avian flu, uh, let's take Rift Valley fever in this region, what has been the impact? But there I think a lot of the impact has not been, I mean it's like many of these scare diseases, the actual impact in mortality and morbidity is quite low. Rift Valley fever has got a, a, a case fatality rate of only about 1-2%. to But the major impact is the panic. Yeah. Because when people panic, then they, they stop buying meat, they, they stop buying... Then when you're going, maybe. <laughs> Which is, you know, maybe, maybe good for some people's waistlines, but on the other hand, it's very bad for the butchers and traders and pastoralists and people who depend on livestock. And it's often the responses, too. Sometimes even if, sort of, if, you, if you removed all external agents, if you removed media, government, NGOs, communities might be able to cope with these. What a thought. What a thought. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the people who are here to solve problems and make things better. And actually it's what they're doing which is causing all the okay, problems. Okay, well picking up, <laughs> up on that point, how do these diseases then, from taking the example of Rift Valley Fever and, and, and others, how do they rank with the more endemic diseases that we have to deal with in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and Asia every day? How, how do they rank? Yeah, in yeah. Terms of our mobility impact, impact on. We do these sort of our pathways, our markets, livelihoods, and productivity. Uh, do, do, does that help to start thinking about that? Well, certainly on the human health side, the impact is the direct impact is not extensive. Um, for the ones that I've been involved in recently, HIV/AIDS, of course, is the exception. Um, but even if you look at bird flu, you know, in Indonesia, there's been 80 deaths or something, 80 cases. So that's an extremely rare disease, but it has tremendous impact because people worry about it in the cities and the price of poultry can, can fall half, you know, based on uh, a rumor in a country. But the actual death loss in, in, in man is very small. Same with Rift Valley Fever, the big impacts are on the market, shutting down, banning slaughter of Larissa. That shut down the pastoral economy and, you know, the, all the spin-off effects, like the schools couldn't feed the kids because the pastoralists couldn't pay the school fees. So they didn't I have to find money for that. Okay, I'll change the subject. We, uh, yesterday we heard quite a bit about climate change yeah. uh, and the impact of climate change, and we didn't talk about it, the impact on disease. Yeah. Uh, my reading is that the, the, the West is really worried that China, climate change is going to expand distributions of vector borne diseases. What is it going to do here? Well, I think we've already, we're already seeing a Rift Valley fever spreading through the region and becoming more of a problem over the last 10 years reaching the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, blue tongue spreading throughout Europe, becoming a European disease, uh, those kinds of But those are, those are all El Nino associated, uh, uh, some constellation associated yeah. phenomena, right? Uh, whereas, I mean, um, Phil's data on Southern Africa shows that the length of growing period is going to drop dramatically. Isn't that going to make the risk of vector borne disease less? If the things became drier, Polar, I would I would suspect so, but um, I think the general trend is towards warmer, and I think it's going to be quite complex. Uh, I think what we'll see is the range of vectors changing over the years, and diseases that weren't problems in some areas that become problems. Do you may disappear from other areas? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the vector-borne disease, obviously, the, if it gets hotter and drier, vector-borne diseases will be less of a problem. But the main problem is not the actual disease, it's the change. Because whenever you get change, you get expansion. Whenever you get expansion, you get movement into <coughs> immunologically naive populations. So, okay, whatever so happens, is going to get that. Okay, now we're going to move on what to, uh, to what, uh, what can Ilri do, uh, do about this? I mean, what can we do? Let's take the Rift Valley Fever, for example, that's, uh, that's about, you talked a little bit about avian flu and what yeah. we can do. Let's take different things. What can, what can we do? Now, in, back in, uh, we had Glyn Davis, uh, who was in the vet lab in, in Nairobi, years ago, he must have left 15 years ago, and Ken Linthicum, who was operating out of Fort Detrick, they did all this prediction, satellite prediction of, uh, of when Rift Valley Fever was going to come in. I mean, did we, really, have we really developed that? Uh, we, did we, thank you very much, I've got a little thing here that uh, actually tells me exactly about what I've got 11 minutes. <laughs> 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 so, technology is taking over, but I'm going to be looking at that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, those, this has been in place for ages, and I think, well, the, I don't see it being used effectively. 
So that my question is, one, is the technology worthwhile? Uh, and, and two is, uh, what else can we do in, in that sort of way? Well, I think um, the technology is good, but one of the problems with the technology for predicting Rift Valley fever is that it's, it's not, it, it's a little bit too sensitive. I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day, and, and these people <laughs> predict, <laughs> predict Rift Valley fever at, at quite, a high, quite a high number of years. And sure enough, they got it right this year, but they've got it wrong in the past. And that made people a little bit less willing to jump up and take action. But also, it's very arguable. Pro but it's very likely that even if, if we had 100% precision in prediction, I think we, would still, we still have an incredible challenge in delivering preventative and, and doing something about epidemics, outbreaks in these remote, isolated areas with minimal infrastructure and, and basically self-governing. Okay, well, given we've got the unexpected and we've got the ones that are expected but every, every few years. Uh, how can Hillary, you mentioned earlier on this morning about having uh, response mechanisms yeah. that are more generic. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I think the two are related. I mean, we've got a, a plethora of early warning systems, not just for Rift, and it's, I think people are recognizing all of a sudden we have like alphabet soup of early warning systems, but no one is listening. Right? Yeah. Decision makers aren't taking the decision, even when the information is there, even when things are predicted. How do we change that? How do we change that? That's a good question. We have to look at what's motivating the decision maker, what's driving him, uh, the policy maker, and then try and find the information that will actually get him to take action. And I think that's true whether it's a drought or a famine or River Valley fever. Yeah. On, the, on the system side, we need good, accurate information um, on what's actually happening in these remote areas, as, as Billy has said. I just want to get back to your, uh, your avian flu that you were talking about. One thing you didn't, uh, there was a paper that came out from uh, Alex Dearman and colleagues uh, a couple of weeks ago, which I think you saw, which talked about the, the new paradigm of controlling uh, avian flu. What is the new paradigm? I don't know the new paradigm. But I do know that the thinking is shifting to it's a disease that we're going to have to live with and that uh, we're going to have to be thinking about ways to suppress the disease, to reduce the risk of a virus infecting man, because that's the event that's high risk when the virus could evolve to a pandemic strain. Um, so I think there's a whole shift in thinking about what kinds of interventions can work and you know that one-off culling and vaccination operations aren't going to do anything, but really looking at how can we su suppress the disease while preserving people's livelihoods and um, live with the disease until hopefully it evolves away. Delia's right, there's going to be another flu epidemic. It may not be H5N1, but there's going to be another one. That's, that's the epidemiology of the disease. So Delia, what's the new paradigm in your, in your view? Well, you might have H9N2 is, is just as likely to emerge, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think um, one new paradigm at a time is probably enough, so I'll <laughs> stick with Jeff's and, and agree that a, a lot of these we have to live with, but also we have to, we have to, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of symptomatic of most human diseases that the things we fear and the things that kill us are completely different. So people panic over BSE, they stop buying hamburgers, they, 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 get rid of the, they get, got rid of the Ministry of Livestock over BSE, which was basically what happened in the UK. But then when they're out panicking, they, they have a couple of beers to relax themselves and a couple of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> then they calm down a little bit. <laughs> so I think we need a whole new way of, of dealing, of understanding so understanding impact. Particularly, I think we're very vulnerable because, because the, the major media in the West, uh, the people uh, at greatest of risk of somebody's movement of disease in the rest, uh, and yet uh, the, the situation from, for our clients is, is quite different. How you, last question, how are you going to do that? What is going to be your, your, your major new initiative to, to change that perspective? How are you going to do it? Well, one thing we're looking at is these risk-based approaches. So this is moving away from the presence of hazards, from just the pathogen is there, help, run for the hills, to sort of what is the risk to human health what, and what is the likelihood of it happening. So first of all, how many people are going to die, what is the probability of this, and what can be done about it. And this is a much more rational and useful way of looking at disease. The problem is communicating that and, and trying to make this a more common way of looking at disease. Okay. Delia and Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Very good. Excellent.